It's a little early, but the doors are closed. We have a lot of ground to cover, so let's get started. Would you bow with me in prayer? Our dear Father, we thank you for this opportunity to open your word together, to study your will for us, to read these stories of the miracles of Jesus. Please build our faith, help our unbelief, help us to become better stewards of the gospel that you've given to us by following these stories closely and making them a part of us. These things we ask in his name. Amen. We're going to conclude with the miracles of physical healing today, and then we'll launch into the last portion of our miracle sessions with the miracles of resurrection for the last three sessions of this half of the trimester. And then we'll start talking about the parables of Jesus uh, in three weeks, three, uh, three sessions. Um, we'll first talk about the man with edema uh, from Luke. We'll talk about the ten lepers. You recall that story? Also, either the two men or a blind Bartimaeus. And then lastly, we'll talk about Malchus. We don't oftentimes talk about Malchus, but we will today. Um, as you recall, we did discuss the fact that there were quite a few healings that occurred on the Sabbath. And you think back about some of the ones that were kind of preeminent for us. Uh, we'll talk about another one today, the man with edema from Luke 14. We'd also talked about the crippled woman from Luke 13. The man born blind that we talked about last week from John 9. And then the man with the withered hand that was in the synagogue uh, during the proceedings of the synagogue itself. Interesting. Now we've discussed a little bit about the Sabbath and how this was woven into Jesus' dealings with the Pharisees. We'll talk about the healing of the man with edema. Edema. <clears throat> this was also a Sabbath healing and presents itself in a way that um, will make a big difference with how the Pharisees approach Jesus. Only found in the book of Luke, as we find several different things which are strictly in Luke's. He had some unique uh, miracle uh, discussions. Previously, um, we did talk about Pre, I think, a couple of times. Someone tell me where Perea was. I think I just zapped out. There we go. Um, we'll talk about Perea then in just a moment in, in lieu of discussions right now. Um, the Pharisees did warn... In verse 31 of chapter 13, they warned Jesus, go somewhere else for Herod wants to kill you. This was Herod Antipas, one of the sons of Herod the Great. And we know that uh, Perea was controlled by Herod Antipas. So it kind of makes sense that this is talking about this particular Herod. And New Testament commentaries will talk about Jesus' Perean ministry. The part of his ministry in which he spent time in Perea. And this began with his departure from Galilee to the other side of the Jordan. So picture the Jordan north and south, and this would be the east bank, if you will. Perea extended from close to the Dead Sea, or Sea of Galilee, and then all the way down into about the mid portion of the Sea of Gal or the Dead Sea, rather. If you look at um, the end of the time in which he was performing his Perea ministry. It was about the time that Mary anointed him with oil, and it was from the town of Bethany, which was also sometimes called Bethany on the other side of the Jordan, or beyond the Jordan, and this was in the area of Perea. Here's a map showing this uh, town of Bethany beyond the Jordan, and you'll picture the Jordan River flowing north-south. I'm not sure if you can see it real well, but that Center section beginning about halfway up the Dead Sea along the east bank of the Jordan is Perea. Above that is the Decapolis. Then we have the Sea of Galilee. 
And then Galilee proper to the east or the west of the Sea of Galilee. And then between Galilee and Judea lies Samaria that we'll talk about in some detail. Here's a bit more clear map showing Perea on the side there. So Jesus is spending time in Perea, and this man with edema is in Perea. Herod the Great uh, was king over all this region, and then when he was passing along, he bequeathed it to his four sons, split it up um, much like um, many different leaders have done in the past to great peril to their kingdoms because it always occurs that the sons will bicker and fight and eventually lose control of the, of the country. So edema, what is edema? Dropsy, okay. What's dropsy? In the archaic English, none of us use the word dropsy. In the King James Version, uh, dropsy is the word that's used. Edema is basically an abnormal collection of interstitial fluid. What's interstitial fluid? It's fluid that is in the tissue between cells, where it doesn't really belong. So we have fluid running through our circulatory system, blood, and it's supposed to be kept in the vessels, but the fluid portion of the blood sometimes gets through too easily into the tissues where it does not belong and can collect. And that collection tends to be where, yeah, the lower parts of your extremities. And so gravity helps with that collection. That's why that happens. So it's usually the extremities. And uh, usually, not always, related to some kind of an underlying condition. Something which promotes the formation of this fluid. And it can be your heart. You've heard about people having congestive heart failure where their heart's not pumping hard enough. Fluid backs up and produces an extra collection. It can be from the kidneys, where the kidneys are failing or not functioning properly, and the fluid content doesn't have the right amount of protein, and you gain water in your tissues the same way. It can be from the liver. If you have liver damage from cirrhosis or having had hepatitis or something else. So lots of different kinds of medical conditions can produce this. It's of note that Luke, what was his profession? Physician. And it seems like he does put a lot of emphasis on some of these healings with conditions that would be pretty well known to him as a, as a doctor. This is uh, an advanced stage of this edema. Sometimes you may have heard the term elephantiasis. Have you heard that? Looks kind of like elephant legs here because they get so big. And that's the extreme form of this extra fluid collection. So this man was suffering from a significant amount of, of uh, fluid collection that was here. Question. And we know the story. We're going to read it in just a moment. I want you to be thinking about, was this a friendly crowd? Was this a friendly crowd that Jesus finds himself amongst or an antagonistic one? Let's read the story. Luke 14. One Sabbath, when Jesus went to eat in the house of a prominent Pharisee, he was being carefully watched. There in front of him was a man suffering from abnormal swelling of his body. Jesus asked the Pharisees and experts in the law, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? But they remained silent. So, taking hold of the man, he healed him and sent him on his way. Then he asked them, if one of you has a child or an ox that falls into a well on the Sabbath day, will you not immediately pull it out? And they had nothing to say. So reading that story, was this a friendly crowd or an antagonistic one? What do you think? Seems like they're still just trying to figure out what's going on here. 
Okay. I think everyone heard Scott. Trying to figure out what's going on. Um, and we know they've got a track record of trying to trip him up, right? Many times he was, Jesus found himself in a setup where he was being an attempt at having a trap, trapping him in his words, trapping him in his actions. And here we find a situation where he's, several different clues might tell us. Any other comments about that? The reason for the Sabbath, and he's proving he's Lord of the Sabbath. It uh, it doesn't make a difference whether they've made ten rules or one hundred and ten rules. He's saying I'm Lord of the Sabbath, and in this particular story, it's in the house of a prominent Pharisee, not some run of mill guy, but someone who's a prominent Pharisee. Number two, it was on the Sabbath, as Jay mentioned specifically, and it says. Notably, that Jesus was being carefully watched. Now, we might ask ourselves, as Scott has suggested, that this watching might have been people that wanted to find out more about Jesus. Perhaps. They might have been carefully watching to see how he would respond because the experts in the law were there as well. Verse 3 specifically mentions that these experts were there and they were apparently the ones that were carefully watching him. They knew the law. They knew the rules about the Sabbath. And here's this man with an obvious condition. And where is he at? Right in front of him. So the master of the ceremonies or the master of the house has seated them and they put this man directly in front of Jesus can't miss him. So what do you think about that? You have to read between the lines, perhaps. Could be a setup. Could be a setup. What do you think? Definitely. So is this a trap about to be sprung or not? Let's look at some other details of the story and think about it with an open mind. Um, first of all, it says twice, what? They didn't answer. They remained silent. Now, we know that Jesus has effectively quelled their arguments in the past. Maybe they've heard about this, and they know there's no basis in the law for not healing on the Sabbath. And they can't answer it, so they don't. Or perhaps it could be that they're now recognizing there's no basis for their arguments and maybe they need to rethink this. Maybe. We'll give them the, the fair side of the, of the argument here and think that perhaps they are seekers. Perhaps they are thinking about this message, at least this particular Pharisee. Uh, number two, there is a guest in verse 15 later in the chapter that seems to make a positive comment and actually makes a quotation, a reference from Isaiah 25, when he says, after Jesus' comments about the banquet, blessed is the man who will eat at the feast in the kingdom of God. It's not an interrogatory statement. It's not anything he's trying to pick an argument. He's making a positive comment. And at least this one particular feast goer seems to be kind of on Jesus' side. So I might set before you that perhaps others were as well. Um, if they were intending to trap Jesus, they didn't really seem to follow through with the plan because they didn't, they didn't even attempt to open up a trap for Jesus in this case. Um, perhaps this prominent Pharisee was simply like somebody else we remember Nicodemus, another prominent Pharisee that had an interest 
in Jesus as perhaps he really was the Messiah. Perhaps he was of the mindset of we need to investigate this and find out if this truly is the one that we've been told about. Perhaps he's trying to become the person that Jesus describes there in verse 13. Open your Bible to chapter 14 and verse 13. And in this situation, it's kind of unique that he is uh, taking, not unique, his course of action is normal here, that he talks about things as they come up. He finds ways to use the situation he finds himself in as a teaching opportunity. He does it here as well. After he heals this man, and you gotta think about this, it's not just a matter of getting rid of edema. We talked about the medical condition behind it. Whatever the cause of this was, congestive heart failure with his heart, renal failure with his kidneys, a bad liver, it was all healed. Jesus just made him well, sent him on his way. But he uses this as an opportunity in verse 13. He says, when you give a dinner, do not invite your friends, your brothers or relatives or your rich neighbors. If you do, they may invite you back and so you'll be repaid. But when you give a banquet, invite the poor, invite the crippled, invite the lame, the blind, and you'll be blessed. And this prompted this guest in the next verse to say, blessed is the man who will be in that feast given by God in the kingdom of God. Let's talk about the 10 lepers. If you will turn again uh, to Luke chapter 17. Beginning in verse 11 is where this is found. Leprosy. We've, we don't hear much about leprosy. Has anyone ever been to a leper colony? Arkansas man here. Yeah, I think there's in Hawaii. Um, there's a leper colony in Hawaii that's an active leper colony still. Um, anybody else? Anyone ever had leprosy? It's rare, but leprosy is also known as Hansen's disease. Um, good Norwegian name. That was the, the, the fellow who discovered its cause. It was felt to be hereditary up until 1878 when this fellow used a newfangled microscope and discovered a specific bacteria called Mycobacterium leprae. Um, Mycobacterium is the same thing that produces tuberculosis. So it's a very slow-growing semi-bacteria that's almost like a fungus um, in a lot of its behavior. Um, it is a very unusual infection in that it is very, very chronic. It's very slow growing and moving. And it's associated with some pretty severe problems with the skin, with the peripheral nerves. Your nerves are very much damaged by leprosy which produces a loss of sensation especially. And if you've heard about peripheral neuropathy, like in diabetes, um, you get numbness in your hands and in your feet, same thing happens but to a severe degree in a, a leprous person, and that happens oftentimes in the very young. Now, you think, well, losing your sensation, that's not such a bad thing. It's not painful. Why might that be a bad thing? Wouldn't know you, had it. you wouldn't know you had it? Okay. Well, you would when your skin started nodding up. And you're... But what can happen without sensation? Yeah. You get hurt. Um, if you've noticed me standing here, I've been shifting from my left foot to my right foot to my left foot, and if you were to stand here, you would do exactly the same thing, and you don't even think about it. If you look at a group of people anywhere standing and watch after church today, just look in the foyer as you're watching people standing around, and they'll be shifting from one foot to the other. And that's not because of some kind of a need for movement. 
uh, that's built into you. It's the nerves in your feet telling your brain, okay, time to, time to shift. Why? Your feet might fall asleep. You take the pressure off the bottom of your feet, Scott, Scott said. And that's exactly right. If you take skin and put pressure on it, what are you going to see on my skin here? A little white patch, right? It's white because it doesn't have any blood in it, and then it pinks up again. So the same thing is happening on the bottom of your feet. And if you don't take that pressure off, the soft tissue loses its blood supply, and it dies. You lose all the tissue in the bottom of your feet. So you're constantly protecting your feet by moving it like that. Same thing with you shifting in your seat just now. You go, yeah, I got to shift a little bit to get the pressure off of those lower areas. Because the same thing would happen. And if you don't do that, you hear about people in the nursing home getting a, a bed sore. So protective sensation, extremely important. And if you don't have it, it's not protective. And so you start having injury to different things where pressure is found. And you can lose fingers, and you can lose toes, and you can lose limbs with leprosy. And it happens with anyone who has leprosy. Here's a picture of someone that has had this lack of protective sensation. You can see their fingers are just shriveled and shrunk and contracted, and some digits are lost because of this. So it's a very significant problem. Interestingly, um, if you think about biblical leprosy, we, we feel like biblical leprosy is perhaps more contagious than modern day leprosy. It's not very contagious. Um, you have to have repeated close exposure to secretions from the, from the nose and the mouth over time for this to happen. Just like getting tuberculosis is not really easy to do. But interestingly enough, does anybody know about uh, the recent migration of visitors from the south in the form of little animals? Yes. Who has seen an armadillo in Warren County? They're here, and they weren't here 10 years ago. Um, they're gradually moving north. But what do you know about armadillos and leprosy? They are common carriers. In fact, most armadillos are endemic, if we call that, with leprosy. They carry mycoplasma lepra. Now, you're not likely to get it from uh, an armadillo. You'd have to be really up close and personal with an armadillo to get, get leprosy. But um, fortunately, uh, it's hard to get them even from close contact. Today... Um, we think it's less contagious. About 208,000 people in the entire world have leprosy. So it's not very common. But about 100 cases a, a year in the U.S. are diagnosed. And most of those, Travis mentioned that there was a leper colony in Hawaii. And most of those are in Hawaii and California. And some in the southern states too. But there's actually more on the west coast and Hawaii. Across the world, it's found in, in several different places. Interestingly, Brazil has a, a large number of leprosy cases as well. It takes about up to three to five years to incubate this if you're exposed to it and can take as long as 20 years. So very slow-growing uh, infection. Treatment, antibiotics for six to 12 months now. But in the time of Jesus' day, pre-antibiotics, there was no treatment at all. And we did not have this protective immunity that we have now. Today, Americans, 95% of people or more, are naturally immune to leprosy. In Jesus' day, this was not the case. Um, if you were around someone with leprosy, you had a pretty good chance of, of getting uh, leprosy as well. Can you think of some Old Testament lepers? We'll switch over now. Naaman. Naaman comes to mind. Um, Naaman, the Syrian army commander that 
came to Elisha and said, help me. Nothing else has helped me. Uh, and was washed in the Jordan. Uh, who else? Someone mentioned Miriam. From Numbers 12, Moses' sister. You recall the story. She and Aaron were talking badly about Moses because of his Cushite wife, Zipporah. And um, the Lord descended in a cloud and had them meet at the tent of meeting. And when he went back up again, Miriam was left white like a lamb with, with leprosy. And Moses pleaded for her, and she was healed after she was sent out of the camp for seven days in a quarantine. So there was very much uh, a quarantine situation with leprosy. For the leper, lots of implications. Um, Number one, everybody was terrified of it. And so physically, it was a hopeless situation. The only cure that they might have known about was the story of Naaman and Miriam. And otherwise, they didn't know anybody who'd ever been cured of leprosy. Occasionally, it would burn itself out, but that was extremely rare. Socially, they were isolated. They couldn't be near anybody except other lepers. Um, Isolated in the rigorous leper laws of chapters 13 and 14. If you want to flip over there sometime during this class or later and just look at all the details about dealing with these skin diseases and conditions. Uh, They were isolated in a very severe way. And the rabbis, even beyond the Levitical law, added many more layers of protection, if you will, to keep the lepers away from the rest of um, the people of Israel. Ceremonial washing, if you touched a leper, if they happened to touch your clothes, you had to burn your clothes. If they happened to use one of your cooking pots or dishes, you had to shatter the pot. Pretty significant. So nobody wanted to be around a leper for these reasons as well. Nowadays, good question. They're all, they're all like tuberculosis sanatoriums. They have historical significance for the fact they were there for a long time. Um, and people still go there for receiving treatment because it takes a year, six to 12 months. Um, so I know that pe- some people go there for receiving treatment as well for leprosy. There's more involved with leprosy and a lot of people that end up at these colonies have been in equatorial Africa, Indonesia, and they've not received treatment for maybe decades. And so they go there for the other treatments that are required, the surgical treatments and the reconstructive treatments and everything else. So, but good question, Sharon. Why do they have leper colonies? That's why. Emotionally, they were very, very much held in check as well. They were required by law, if someone came close, to yell, unclean, unclean. Imagine that. Talking about yourself every time you came close to someone, declaring yourself to be unclean. So lots of implications here. The people that, if you think about the Jews' response to leprosy, it seems like they have a, 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 an attitude that this is a judgment for sin. But if you think about the people in the Old Testament that were judged for their sins by becoming leprous, we have examples of that. Miriam, we just talked about. Her sin was what prompted her to become leprous as a direct judgment from Jehovah. And the Jews knew this story very well. If you think about Gehazi, related to Naaman's story, that was Elisha's servant. You recall Naaman wanted to give him silver and garments and gifts, and Naaman declined it. But Elisha's servant said, went around behind his back and ran after Naaman and said, uh, he'll take it now to keep it for himself. And because of his subterfuge, Elisha told him, you're going to have Naaman's leprosy. And not just you, but all your household will have leprosy. And then lastly, King Isaiah. Remember King Isaiah, a good king. He was a pretty good king. 
until he was so successful he became full of pride and thought he could be taking the place of the priests by offering incense sacrifice. And so God struck him down with leprosy as well. So these stories in the Jewish mindset were sort of the basis for them saying, you know what, they must have done something that was bad. And they're just getting what they deserve, so we can treat them poorly because it's what they deserve. And this was the common problem. But also there was a lot of religious exclusion for the lepers. If a person had leprosy, they were not permitted to approach a priest. They couldn't go into the temple. Where else could they not go? A synagogue? And they couldn't participate in any form of corporate worship like we're doing today. So lots of, lots of big problems with this. Let's read the story. Luke 17, beginning in verse 11. Now on his way to Jerusalem, Jesus traveled along the border between Samaria and Galilee. As he's going into a village, 10 men who had leprosy met him. They stood at a distance and called out in a loud voice, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. And this master was that Greek word, remember the Greek word we talked about, kurios, which is not to say boss or big guy. <laughs> it is saying my spiritual master, the master of my soul. When he saw them, he said, go show yourselves to the priests. Did they sit down and have a discussion about what they should do? <laughs> Did they argue amongst themselves about, wait a minute, we're not supposed to go to the priest. They set off for the priest. And it says, as they went, they were cleansed. So on their way to see the priest, before they actually had proof of it, they were demonstrating a faith in what Jesus had to say. And on the way, their leprosy was cleansed. One of them, when he saw he was healed, before he got to the priest, came back praising God in a loud voice. He threw himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him, and it makes special note, and he was a what? Samaritan. We don't know how many Samaritans were in this group, but we know that they weren't all Samaritans, or Jesus would not have said, go to the priests. Right? A Samaritan wouldn't have done that. But Jesus asked, were not all ten cleansed? Where are the other nine? Has no one returned to give praise to God except this foreigner, this non-Jew, this Gentile? Then he said to him, rise and go, your faith has made you well, because it was a demonstration of his faith for him simply to go and, and seek out a priest. If you think about this situation with the one returning, the solo returnee was the Samaritan. Um, the ten lepers were alerted. They alerted Jesus they were unclean and asked for healing, using this special word for the spiritual master demonstrated their faith. And Jesus tells them to show themselves to the priest. This was based upon Leviticus 13. The priests were given authority to examine the leper, and if the leprosy had left them, to declare them either clean or unclean. That was completely in their purview to do that. If you think about other faithful Gentiles that Jesus praised, we've talked about some in this class. The Canaanite woman, the, the Syrophoenician woman from Matthew 15 and Mark 7, whose daughter was healed. And the centurion from Matthew 8 and Luke 7. So the Samaritan was the one here that returns. This Samaritan's return is significant. Um, what about Samaria? What do you know about this idea of him being a Samaritan? On this map, uh, Samaria, like I mentioned, is situated the blue 
country between Galilee to the north, Judea to the south. How did this come about? You recall history of Israel. Originally, when Israel was Israel, um, about 3,000 years before this miracle occurred, the northern tribes broke away to become the kingdom of Israel. Uh, Israel, the kingdom of Israel, later became the kingdom of Samaria, named after the, the capital city that was there, the city of Samaria. So it actually became the kingdom of Samaria. The Assyrian captivity around 726 B.C. took most of the people away, left a few. And during that period of captivity, some things happened in this territory. We still had some pagan people left behind, had a few Jews left behind, but they no longer had the priesthood, they no longer had synagogue teaching, they no longer had lots of things. And an amalgamation of faith sort of happened. Uh, the remaining Samaritans later claimed that they were descended from the true Israel. They claimed to be part of the ten lost tribes. And so they had some different ways of thinking about things. Remember the woman at the well who asked Jesus, we, we worship at Mount Gerizim and the Jews worship in Jerusalem, what's the difference? Some very severe discord took place between these two groups of people, which began about 400 BC. By this time, it was quite a big problem and could even give some difficulties for travelers. We know that the disciples oftentimes, when traveling back and forth between Galilee and Judea, were very cautious about going through Samaria. And they, with good reason, because the Samaritans hated the Jews and the Jews hated the Samaritans. There was a potential for real danger of traveling through. Okay, we're going to turn to blind Bartimaeus, or the two blind men. This is the last healing of blind that we'll talk about. Blind Barty. Uh, Bartimaeus means the son of... Timaeus, think about Simon Bar, Jonah, the son of Jonah. <clears throat> this is toward the end of Jesus' ministry as well. We know there are three different accounts in the Gospels in which blind people are healed in the vicinity of Jericho. Three different accounts, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Matthew's account, if you look at it in chapter 20, mentions that there are Two men, it says, it doesn't give a name, and it states that Jesus encountered these two men upon leaving Jericho and healed them of their blindness. Mark's account, chapter 10, says there's one unnamed man, blind man, who was also healed while Jesus was leaving Jericho. But Luke's account says there's, again, one man, but he names, I'm sorry, Mark names a man, Luke does not. Mark names the man as Bartimaeus. Luke's account, he doesn't name him, but states that he was healed as Jesus was approaching Jericho. How do we get these facts to jive? Is it possible that these are describing more than one event? It's possible. Quite possible. More than one healing that might have taken place around the time. What's another option? Yeah, could have been two separate events, but around the same time. One theory is that Bartimaeus called for Jesus and didn't get his attention, went in the city and followed him in, was healed as he was going in, 
but he recruited another blind man who then was healed on the way out. All kinds of complicated stories. But I would present to you another option, which I think is very interesting. How about more than one Jericho? Ever heard of two Jerichos? There were two Jerichos. And it's kind of interesting. If you look at uh, this close-up map here, the top one says OT, the bottom says NT. Jericho kind of moved a little bit. The old Jericho at the time of Jesus was largely in ruins. It had kind of been slowly crept to the west. Mostly because if you look at the little dotted lines that are there, there's a big trade route that comes down from a city called Scythopolis and meets with two other roads. And at this junction, it's kind of like when an interstate <laughs> puts in a, an exit, what happens? The land becomes very expensive and gas stations are put up and then places of business are put up and all kinds. That's what happened with Jericho. So there's actually about two miles apart, two separate Jerichos. So in thinking about this, it depends upon your perspective. Was it leaving Jericho or was it approaching Jericho? And it may have been just simply their perspective on how they talked about that. I'll leave you with this comment, and that is verse 31. The two men were, were shouting to them, Lord, Son of David. What's the significance of that term we've talked about? Scott said, no one's going to keep him quiet. This blind man has tried to learn all he can about Jesus and the stories he's heard. And does he fit the messianic role? And the messianic title is the son of David. We know from Romans 3, Paul talks about Jesus as being a descendant of David according to the flesh. We know that in the genealogies, if you look through there, he's the son of David. Isaiah talks about him being the son of David. So this is a messianic title. And Bartimaeus is declaring, this is the Lord, the Curios. Um, okay, thank you for your attention. I, I'm sorry I couldn't talk about Malchus. I will mention one thing. The high priest's servant Malchus had his which ear cut off? The right ear. Who cut it off? John tells us it was Peter. Who's the only account? All four Gospels mention this story. Only one of them talks about the fact that Jesus healed the ear. Who was it? Luke, the physician. That was pretty impressive to Luke, and he mentions it. So thank you for your attention.